so I guess more than anything I just wanted to do a quick video and give some context on a few things to do with anticipation so firstly I guess I wanted to just have a look at some of the the good stories we had a couple of photos bit of video you know from back in the day when the boat was pretty pretty wild you know we, we did have some good times in that boat and then I just wanted to touch on what happened you know obviously for anyone that doesn't know we sunk that boat the boat's still out at sea so I just wanted to give a bit of a I suppose rundown on my side of that and what actually happened and then the third part of that story is I just wanted to um I suppose give some context into how I've now got a boat called Revenge and where that name came from. I think I always intended on doing this video, but I just wanted to do it in my own terms. You know, I wanted to do it um, with myself editing it, you know, the content that I want in here, talk about what I want to put in here. And then if people want to watch it, then great, so be it. And if they don't want to or they don't like it, then that's not an issue for me at all. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, this is mine. But I think the biggest thing that I think of when I, when I think about anticipation is the fun we had on that boat. The boat rode really well, you know, like, as I said, we never once felt like we were out of our depth or, you know, you look at some of the photos, I'll throw these photos on now, you know, we had days, you know, this was following a, I don't know what size it was, but this was following a substantially larger boat inside, um, coming through the heads at Nelson Bay, as you can see, you can only just pick up the hard top of the boat. Uh, this is another storm we got stuck in, you know, yet again, a very rough day. Um, you know, that the boat just never struggled, you know. I think one of the really good things about anticipation was it was a boat that caught fish. And, you know, some people might believe that, some people don't. I certainly do. Um, we went shark fishing, you know, and we consistently got fish. Now, you know, granted, we didn't get any big shark or didn't get many big sharks on that boat you know we got one or two around 200 and a 311 like we we, we weren't pulling you know four five hundred kilo fish but we we're consistently getting fish and you know that, that boat was the first time any of us have ever shark fished so we were extremely new to it and you know that was that was just our way of learning the ropes you know so just to be seeing something at the side of the boat you know was was keeping us intrigued and keeping us interested and making us want to go back so the boat certainly did its job in that regard this is a rare view of how rescues happen when things go wrong way out at sea the two fishermen had caught one shark more than 60 kilometres off Newcastle. Late in the afternoon, they hooked a second shark. The boat tipped, took on water and started to sink. So the day we sunk the boat, so... Um, for anyone that doesn't know, Mark, Mark's my best mate. Mark's the person that built Revenge. It was Mark and I, we were fishing two up. We were north of Newcastle Canyons. Um, probably 35 mile, if not a tad more from the heads. Um, we were a pretty decent run. We had the most perfect day all day, so the drift was incredible. Like, it was almost glassed out. The drift was great. You know, there was boats all around us talking about having like two or three knots of current, and you know, we had like zero. We could see current lines everywhere around us. We could see temp lines everywhere. And the boat just sat in this perfect drift, you know, relatively slowly all day. Like, we, you couldn't have asked for a better drift. It was amazing. We had music on, we had food, we... It was a really, really good day. Um, we got the first shark. No one's ever going to believe this story. But our first shark, we, we busted off. We busted off at the leader. So it still had the leader and the float was still attached to it as well. Um, so the sharks disappeared, we've lost it, we've put the baits back out again, 
and then we've seen our leader on the surface like we could literally see our leader swimming around so we drove over <laughs> tried to catch the bottle we missed the bottle unfortunately and the shark went deep and we lost it but we, we nearly got the shark just by grabbing the leader you know that was still on the surface as the shark swam around it was so close so you can imagine the adrenaline and the morale on the boat like we were pretty pumped up you know that was pretty cool so then we left there um went back to drifting again it wasn't too long till the rod went off we hooked up got that shark to the boat captured that shark and believe it or not that shark has two mustard 18 o's and two liters so it's the same shark that we just busted off the same shark that we almost grabbed you know free grab free grabbed i suppose on the leader we'd managed to capture again so we got our hook leader back again um I don't I'm sure there's other people that have done that that was that was really cool you know that was a very cool experience to get our leader back like that and that just further increased it you know like the morale pumped again you know and so then we get the first shark on the deck drag the shark over to the side of the boat go to winch the second shark in and we start having some trouble with the second shark so we get it halfway into the boat and drop it twice anyway on the third attempt we get it in the boat and this is where everything goes south for us. Shark hits the deck, shark rolls, shark rolls, shark ends up directly on top of other shark right on the side of the boat. The boat listing heavily goes into the trough. As the boat goes into the trough, the next wave perfectly hits it straight over the side. That increases the weight obviously, laying it down even more. The next wave, same thing, straight over the side. So at this point, we've got water, you know, pretty much up to the height of the, the side pockets in the boat. So, you know, yay deep, you know, in the back corner. Boats lift, listing fairly heavily. And Mark and I are frantically trying to drag this shark back across to distribute some weight. We drag the shark across, we redistribute the weight. But by then, it's too late. The water's on the deck, the boat's weighed down, damage is done. This is where it gets interesting because it's at this point that we realize that we we're in some deep trouble. What do you do? You continue drifting with the boat listing heavily. In that situation, you keep getting waves over the side. Not an option. You reverse, bury the transom, boat sinks. Not an option. The best option we could see was to drive the boat forward, left hand down. Boat has a self-training deck. Left hand down would help distribute the weight evenly. Granted, it'll all run to the back. But left hand down, drive the boat forward, water rush out of the deck. Not too fast, not too slow, enough to run the water through the scuppers back into the ocean. So I tell Mark I'm going to do that. We obviously have life jackets on. Um, I hand Mark the EPIRB at this point. I said, set the EPIRB off. If worst comes to worst, and we, well, if best comes to best, it's probably a better, you know, term terminology, and everything ends up fine, then, you know, we'll just call up on the radio on the VHF and tell them I've set the EPIRB off, it's a false alarm not to bother. I said, but if something does go seriously wrong, we've set the EPIRB off. So Mark sets the EPIRB off, I walk to the steering wheel, knock the boat in gear, boat rolls straight onto its roof, straight away, straight over, onto its roof. Um... The next thing I, I can remember grabbing the hard top and pulling myself because the boat was upside down. You know, I was in the cab when it rolled. I can remember grabbing the hard top and pulling myself out to swim out behind the boat, which means I don't remember it and I didn't see them. But, you know, if you think about it, I have to have swum past them two sharks to get to the back of the boat. Don't remember it, did not see them at all. Thank God. Anyway, I surface. I can see the boat upside down on its roof, um, floating, you know, 20, 25 metres away. At this point, Mark's climbed up, Mark's already climbing up onto the hull, Mark's working his way up towards, you know, the bow rail, I suppose. I swim over to the boat, um, unfortunately I'm not as athletic as Mark. I try to climb up the keel, cut myself to pieces, climbing up the keel's not an option. By this time, the boat's basically floating vertical. It is, so it's straight up and down. 
I swim around the side of the boat and basically end up standing like standing on the windscreen holding the bow rails so I'm up to say here in water um, just holding onto the bow rails as the boat just just bobs you know we check the EPIRB, the EPIRB's going off we've got life jackets on, we've got flares everyone always asks you know how long were you in the water for and to be honest I have no idea I don't know whether it took the Westpac chopper 10 minutes to get there I don't know whether it was an hour and a half it felt like about six days um, but honestly they got there very quickly and we basically just drifted there waiting for the chopper to turn up as soon as I heard it sent a parachute flare up um, waited probably another 20 30 seconds and then sent another parachute flare up um, so then that's kind of it for us um, you know anticipation was gone and um, you know we got this photo that night this is back at Pelican Air Base um, the night that we we got picked up by the chopper and you know we're all there and kind of telling our story and sore and sorry for ourselves, but I guess it didn't really sink in you know till the next day waking up and you know having to get a lift back to the boat ramp to pick up my car with a boat trailer on it I tow it home with no boat I can clearly remember saying this to Mark at the time so Mark's on the bow rail I'm standing on the windscreen you look back towards the coast it was honestly one of the best sunsets I've ever seen. There was a thunderstorm kind of working its way up the coast. At the same time, the sun's going down, so the clouds were like black. If it wasn't black, it was golden because of the sun. It was incredible, hey. You know, and then you can combine, you combine that then with standing on the windscreen of your seven meter boat, looking straight up in the air at the Westpac chopper with someone winching down into your boat to rescue you like i wish i never ended up in that circumstance don't get me wrong but that was by far the most incredible thing i have ever witnessed were we scared no and honestly i'm not proud enough that i wouldn't admit it you know if i was genuinely scared and afraid for my life i would sit here and i'd own it but the reality is is that wasn't the case um it all happened too quick there was too much adrenaline that's the reality of it you know there was too much adrenaline by the time we realized we were in trouble you know the boat had flipped by the time the boat had flipped we'd climbed onto the windscreen and the bow rail you know and set the flare and the epurb off by the time that was done that was kind of the time you could be start to be scared you know because everything happened really quick until that point and even at that point standing on the front of the boat the epurb's gone off you've got flares you've got your life jackets on it's still daylight you know something i'll never forget is there was a packet of like the smith's light and tangy chips that floated out of the boat and they were like maybe 10 meters away and i jumped in and i swam over to them grabbed them swam back to the boat opened them up and i was like here you go marco last feed on anticipation you know and we had like a handful of chips each before we obviously threw them in and you know so I guess that's where the name came from. Um, you know, anyone that's ever named a boat would be able to relate to this. It is so hard to name a boat. It can be so difficult. You know, I would argue that it is harder to name a boat than it is to name a child. And I think if you look at some of the names out there, people are giving their children now, then that shows that I'm right. You know, you could pretty much get away with calling your child anything. It's not like that for a boat.
quivering pattern of chopper spray. A rescuer heading down. Two men clinging to their sinking boat. And the black shape of a shark that started it all. This is a rare view of how rescues happen when things go wrong way out at sea. It was just a, the, the actual front of the boat was sticking out of the water um, and the rest had sunk and they were just holding onto the side. The two fishermen had caught one shark more than 60 kilometres off Newcastle. Late in the afternoon, they hooked a second shark. The boat tipped, took on water and started to sink. Matt DiPolito was the winch operator on the Westpac chopper. The pilot can't actually see what's happening uh, below the aircraft, so my job is to be his, his eyes. The chopper has a crew of four, including a New South Wales paramedic. Fortunately, the fishermen were well equipped. They had a EPIRB. The first thing we saw when we got to the scene was the flare they set off. One man was quickly rescued and safely winched up in the fading light. It was more difficult the second trip down. The rescuer's arm motions mean keep going, lower, lower. He was giving me guidance on what height he thinks is most appropriate. He finally reaches the remaining fisherman who is clinging to the wallowing hole. Then brought up out of the sea, wet, cold, but safe. They were extremely grateful uh, to be winched aboard, in good spirits too. The boat though was doomed to sink, with one of the sharks still visible. Mark Burroughs, Nine News.